Welcome to Conversation on Value, a podcast on choices and dreams about reframing value in business and society. I'm your host, Valeria Maltoni. In this episode, we'll explore the question of value in human factors for design with Dr. James Intrilligator, who is professor of the practice department of mechanical engineering and director of human factors engineering program at Tufts University. Conversation on Value is a podcast about how to reframe value in business and society. I'm Valeria, and I've been working on the question of value for more than 20 years. So welcome, uh, James. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have you here, and uh, especially because uh, I try to make this podcast about um, multiple uh, domains and you've uh, touched upon neurology, uh, neuroscience, consumer um, uh, consumer behavior, uh, physics, and even literary criticism uh, in your career. So I'm really excited to have you here. And I wanted really to start uh, to talk a little bit broadly to introduce the question or the the uh, topic of human factors in design. Tell us a little bit about it. Sure, sure. I'd love to. Thanks, for, thanks of course, for having me on the, the podcast. It's really a wonderful thing you're doing here. I think it's an important concept and topic that most people don't think much about, the concept of value. So yeah, I, thanks again for having me. Uh, yeah, so for me, I guess currently I'm a professor of the practice in human factors engineering at Tufts University in Boston. Uh, and it's kind of a new thing for me, actually. I've only been here. Well, I guess I, I keep thinking of myself as new, but it's been seven years now. So I guess it's a bit old. And so it depends how you think of it. Before that, for 13 years, I did work mostly in consumer psychology, which I, I kind of try to make the distinction between consumer behavior and consumer psychology. Consumer behavior looks at what people do and consumer psychology looks at why people do what they do but anyway it's more of a semantic perhaps issue but no thank uh, you that's great yeah um and yeah so now now um i've come to the world of human factors engineering and uh it's a field that i must admit i didn't even really know existed as a field 10 15 years ago but i've fallen in love with it it's it's really uh i, I see it as a, a place where finally all of my different threads can come together and a big part of uh, what I love about it, and a big part of what the field is really about, is kind of design, but in the broadest of terms. So we do design of everything from, you know, products, physical products, designing better chairs or mugs, things like that, uh, to digital products. About half of my students go off and develop apps or websites, things like that, to even systems and processes. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking for the right way, one of our past PhD students does all the system design at a large hospital, designing the way patients go through the system. So Anytime you have kind of a human interacting with, let's say, technology, then there's an interesting opportunity to, to think about the human factors in that design, in that design space. Um, and, and, and an example that I'll often use uh, in when I'm explaining this to my students is that if you're going to, let's say you want to design a new crane for construction, like a big construction crane, uh, you can go and talk to mechanical engineers about designing the right materials, shapes, and pro and all that kind of stuff. And you'd want to have electrical engineers involved to build the right circuitry and all that. But at some point, someone has to design the controls for the crane and the, the chair where the crane operator will sit and the displays and the lights and the buttons. And you know, at that point, it's no longer a question for mechanical engineers or electrical engineers. You really need someone who knows how humans interact with the technology. Uh, and it always reminds me of my one of my, well, my I guess my favorite philosopher really in many ways was Wittgenstein. Uh, and he has this wonderful quote that even the largest telescope has an eyepiece no larger than the human eye. And I just I've always loved that even before I knew human factors was a thing, but it, it's just such a wonderful image that you have this pinnacle of human achievement, engineering technology, this huge, but at some point, now of course it's computer screens, but at least back then, you know, if it doesn't have the right eyepiece, then it just doesn't work. The whole thing is wasted. And it, it's kind of the same with any technology, whether it's an app or whether it's a medical device. This is one area that human factors engineers do a lot of work in is redesigning medical devices. So for me, design and human factors, uh, it, it's really about understanding how to make a system more human friendly, more centered on the human, more appealing to the human. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, I'm going on a little bit uh, just to lay out the groundwork. Uh, the other side of it is that if you're going to try to make something better for a human, 
traditionally, human factors really focused on the physical side of things. So in, in fact, in Europe, human factors and ergonomics are almost the same thing. So it, it tends to focus on making a better chair, for instance, and how big should the chair be and what kind of weights will it support. And, you know, when you're doing any kind of design, uh, the more constraints you can bring into the design space, the easier it is. So, you know, if you're designing a, a mug, let's say, you know, if you know it's a mug for a grown adult, then you know what size the should, if it's a, a mug for a three-year-old child, it's a very different thing. And each constraint you add makes it easier. So design for human factors originally was about bringing human fact, human physical constraints into the design space. Uh, and then in the 19, let's say 40s or something, along comes cognitive human factors, where they realize that there's a lot of thinking, a lot of memory, attention, etc. That's also important for design, especially if you're making apps or websites. Um, and, and some of the directions that I'm trying to push uh, the field into or try to highlight for for uh, many of the methods I've been developing is to look at things like emotional constraints, right? So you don't want the mm -hmm. website to just be efficient and let's say comfortable if you want to focus on the physical. You also want it to have the right emotional um, connections. And, and that's kind of why, why I, in some ways I see my background in consumer psychology coming into it as well, right? Because they're branding, marketing, advertising, um, store layout, all of that is also about emotion. So I, I like to think of design as just navigating this multiple dimensional space, infinite dimensional space, where you try to understand the physical constraints, the cognitive constraints, the emotional constraints, and now, of course, things like sustainability is important, uh, environmentalism, etc., uh, legal, uh, social justice constraints now is a, a huge issue. So that, that's kind of how I think of design is navigating these constraints and human factors is understanding the human constraints that might be relevant to the design space. So is there, because there's a, a lot of conversation around technology and how the system of technology is influencing the behavior, and you made the distinction between psychology and behavior, uh, is influencing the behavior, um, uh, human behavior. And so, um, you know, kind of the, almost like the technology forces humans to behave in a certain way if they want to use certain tools. Now, is design with human factors in mind, is design the, almost like the counterbalancing force where you can bring more of the, what humans need from a psychological standpoint um, you know, back into the technology as a system to influence how we build technology? Or is it more downstream? Is it more like in the final um, execution of a product or, or a system? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, um, you know, I, I would say it, it first of all, it's, it should be all along, even from the very earliest stages of designing a system, you really need to understand, you know, who's going to be the user, what are you, what are they trying to achieve? What are you as the designer or the funder, for instance, trying to achieve? So, you know, if you're making a product, uh, you need to spend a lot of time thinking about the users of the product. You need to think about also the consumers, the uh, the customers of the product. Sorry. So like uh, an example there would be like baby baby products, right? The, the consumer of the product is different than the customer. The parents do the buying yes. and the kids do the consuming. Uh, and pet food and pet toys is another space where the... The, the customer and the consumer are quite different. But, but even at the very earliest stages of design, I think it's important to understand what the customers, the users, and the stakeholders, people within the company, for instance, what matters to them and, and what they want to do to the system as a whole. So sometimes technologies are designed explicitly, specifically, and perhaps uniquely to have kind of a, a um, to help people find greater value or to contribute more to society. Uh, there's many examples of kind of humanitarian focused apps that have been developed, for instance, to help people in war times uh, to find safety or to know where they shouldn't go, et cetera. And, you know, in those kind of cases, the technology is really being used to help support values and human behavior in a, in a positive way, I guess I would say. Uh, some of the challenges that, that you often find are if a, let's say there's a company that's making a new product or a service or a system or an app, whatever it is, uh, and they tend not to think about the human side of it, the human factors, until much too late in the de development process. Uh, it, it's the same thing when I used to work much more in sort of the world of marketing. This was the constant complaint of everyone in marketing is that they don't brought in, they don't get brought in and 
till the very end of the project. It's sort of people think of marketing as now let's put the wrapper on it. Let's put the bells and whistles. Let's talk to marketing. But usually marketing, they're often the ones who know most about what features should be in that product, not just the bells and whistles, but the core product itself. Because marketing sort of by nature, people in that field know that you really have to understand the customers, the consumers, the people like that. And somehow uh, the way technology has evolved, the way companies have evolved is they, they don't tend to put much weight and credit and give much voice to people in marketing, people in human factors, people in design in the early stages. They, they tend to mistakenly think, you know, we'll build the airplane and then we'll think about the controls for the airplane. It's like, well, you know, you got to really think about who's going to be flying the airplane from the first moment of design. And it's the same with whatever product you're designing. You need to really understand these kinds of issues. Uh, and that, that's, I think, where human factors, marketing, psychology, uh, empathy, emotionality, all of those things need to really be brought much more early in the process. Um, it's funny because you remind me of, um, you know, help me make people do <laughs> when, when the technologies come to you. And uh, post hoc, and they say, help me make people do. And uh, a much better question would have been, what are people trying to do and how can we make it easier for them? So it's, you know, it's kind of uh, flipping the question. And now, of course, uh, there is a generative uh, artificial intelligence, right? Um, you've uh, uh, written an article about uh, uh, generative, uh, about using AI um, more. Um, through a process of gliding rather than searching. So a lot of people uh, started using uh, chat uh, GPT, for example, like the Google search box, you know, like, like do this, do that. And you suggest that instead uh, you need a different mindset uh, to create the prompts to um, just like what you were saying initially in the process uh, to set up the context correctly. So you want to take me quickly through that because that I thought that was really interesting, uh, particularly the conclusion. Basically, I thought, wow, this is like talking to a person. Uh, so you would talk to chat GPT the same way you would talk to a person, basically. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And and, and uh, it's a specific kind of person. I, I, I'm constantly fascinated by ChatGPT. I spend way too much time using ChatGPT and talking about ChatGPT, uh, but it, it is fascinating. And, and you have to really understand both how it works, how it was created, how it was built, etc., how it thinks in some sense, how it processes information. Uh, but but it really is like you're talking to someone, a naive, almost, I'll say, somewhere on the autistic spectrum, uh, God. So it, it's it's a it's it's been trained up on everything essentially ever created by humans, anything written by humans, etc. Not everything, but but a huge chunk of things, and and it knows sort of everything, but it's sort of forgotten everything, and it also doesn't know who you are and why you're coming to it. Um, but but uh, I've, I've found that the key to getting good results is to not think of it as a search engine, but instead to go in and and think of it as as sort of an exploratory guide glider is the metaphor I often use. So, you know, in any kind of technology, it's important to have the right mental models. So, you know, like the horseless carriage is how they first thought about cars. It's like, it's just like a carriage, but without a horse, it's a horseless carriage. And, and that sort of helps people understand what this machine is meant to do. And I think it's the same here. If you think of ChatGPT as it's a search engine, but kind of made for humans, and it's a search engine that you can talk to, that's not right at all. It's really not a search engine. It's it's not very good, actually, as a search engine, but it's wonderful as a, as a, as a tool to let you explore spaces. Uh, so I, it, for me, it's part of kind of a broader framework and theory that I guess I've been sort of developing over the last know, 15, 20 years, which... Um, I, I think of as uh, transversal design. I've done a lot of work with a colleague of mine, Brian Reynolds at UC Irvine, more in the literary criticism world with transversality. But when I started using ChatGPT a lot, many of my colleagues said, well, you know, you have to be careful because ChatGPT just makes things up. It'll hallucinate. And uh, I want to say to them, yes, of course, I know that. But in a weird way, that's all it ever does. All it ever does is hallucinates. All it ever does is makes things up. It's if you ask it something, it doesn't go and look on the web and find the answer, or it doesn't say, you know, if you ask it, tell me about 
the history of human factors engineering, for instance. It doesn't go and go to Wikipedia and these things. Instead, every word it's giving you, it's generating that word afresh. I, I like to think of it as, initially I used a metaphor that it was like a little wind up robot that you just wind it up and you put it on a piece of paper and it goes along. And as it goes along, it leaves behind text. And that's really what ChatGPT is. It's just a text generator. It's just generating random words. It just happens that it's the fanciest, most sophisticated text generator humans have ever made. And it's generating text, not randomly, but instead it's generating text based on its, you know, billions of hours of training uh, by reading, essentially, or chewing up, digesting all the texts ever written by humans. Um, and, and I'm sure many of your uh, listeners will know that uh, it's it's really trained up to be a next word completer. So if you give it a string of text, it has been trained up to predict what the next word should be. And it continually does that. And that's how it kind of leaves its little trail behind it. Uh, but uh, the, the thing to understand is that it's, if you think of it as this robot that you wind up and you, you let it go, for the robot example, if you want the right results, you need to be sure to put it in the right place on the piece of paper and give it the right directional heading, and then it'll kind of go on its direction. And, and that I that's where I left this the concept of a two-dimensional robot, and I moved to the idea of a glider. So it's a glider that can take you on explorations through different spaces. Uh, and the spaces might be, for instance, uh, if you're interested in, let's say, developing a new toy aimed at seven-year-old kids who have ADHD, for instance, there's a random choice. You have to take the glider and put it in the right position in space. You can say, okay, you know, first, tell me a bit about ADHD. Tell me about what the symptoms are. What are the traits? Tell me about the history. Tell me about different ways people have thought of ADHD. And you can sort of, by, by asking it these kinds of questions, you're slowly nudging it towards what I think of as ADHD space. Uh, and then once you're there, you can say, now tell me also about toys. What do you know about toys? What are fidget toys like? Tell me about 10 kinds of toys that kids with ADHD tend to like. Uh, tell me about developmentally appropriate toys for seven-year-olds. And you're slowly kind of activating the right spaces so that you can then take it on a glide is the way I like to think of it. So once, once the glider understands the, the main winds, the main spaces that you're interested in, you can say, okay, now that you understand about toys and ADHD, can you give me ideas for seven kinds of toys that, you know, I could make, Let, or you, you probably will begin by saying, you know, I, I work at a toy company, we're looking for innovative new products, we want them to be products that can be sold for a certain amount of money. And all of these uh, bits of context are really putting the glider at the right point in conceptual space so that you could then get an effective and useful stream of text coming out of it. Uh, I don't know if that's too abstract, but that, that's kind of the way I think of ChatGPT. Okay. It's, it's this tool for exploring conceptual spaces. Uh, and it's been trained up on everything. If you want to have you know, ideas for treating malaria, you could uh, just ask it, you know, give me 10 ideas for novel ways that we could try to treat malaria. Now, it, if you did that, it might give you some useful things. It might give you, you know, five or six or even 10 useful things, but it might also not realize that you want to come at it, let's say, from a more natural homeopathic way. Uh, so you could begin by saying, you know, I, I'm interested in health technology. I'm interested in health approaches. I'm interested in homeopathic uh, approaches to whatever the case may be. Uh, and, and that will kind of position the glider to understand that that's the, that's the kind of journey you want it to take you on. It's like a tour guide, right? If you go with a tour guide and you go to Rome, you can say, give me a tour. The, the Rome, the tour guide should, the first question they should ask you is, well, what are you interested in? Are you interested in food, art, history? You know, tell me a bit more so I can choose the right path for you to, to go on. And it's really the same with ChatGPT. Uh, in fact, so there is this whole new field and interest in prompt engineering, the idea of crafting the right questions for ChatGPT. And every day there's 10, 15 new uh, posts in various groups that talk about, oh, here's the key. This is what you need to do. You need to ask it with these words. You need to say, pretend you're an expert on medicine. Not something about, uh, and th there's a there's some truth to many of these, but if you really understand what ChatGPT is and what it does, and and I think think of it as this kind of glider metaphor, many of these tips and tricks are really kind of obvious. Like, of course, you should tell it, I'm interested in, uh, you know, if you, if you want advice on how to, to let's say, lose some weight, um, some of the tricks are, you know, tell it that you want it to pretend it's a nutritionist and pretend it's a medical doctor, and then give me some advice on losing weight. Well, of course, right? If you're, it's not a magic trick, it's just telling it, this is what I'm interested in. You should think about 
uh, medical approaches. You should think about nutritionist approaches. And now tell me the answers. You know, you're setting it to the right position to go on its little glide. Yeah, it sounds a lot like conceptual prompts. Yeah. And it's also like uh, the concept of, in humans of priming, right? So if I, if, yes. uh, you, can, you can just give some words, you can give some um, some nudges to someone, and that'll kind of prompt them, prime them to go in the right direction. And you know, oddly or maybe not surprisingly, uh, ChatGPT works much the same way because it's been sort of built on an architecture, machine learning, neural networks kinds of things, and it it has a similar kind of underlying structure and function to the brain. At least that's that's the concept here. <laughs> the, the the thing that um, it fascinates me is though this is all fantastic, but we ought to keep in mind that the content that it's trained on is not vetted. In other words, it doesn't have the judgment or the emotional dimension to understand appropriateness and to understand um, if something is, you know, true or if it's just been written, um, for for lack of a better <laughs> of a yeah, better yeah. explanation. So, like, handle with care. <laughs> definitely, yes, definitely handle with care. But but you know, uh, it's this is a point of active debate in kind of the world of AI, etc. You know, I, I know it, it, I suppose it, it kind of comes down to semantics and stuff. Does it, does it understand? Does it know? But you could ask the same about other humans, right? Does, does, do, do any of us really understand the validity, the source, the data that informed one's opinions, right? So if someone is telling you, you should have, you shouldn't have the vaccine, let's say, uh, for these reasons, well, you know, you have to question what their understanding is of the system. Where are they coming at, et cetera, et cetera. So you never really can sort of trust anything in some sense that's generated by another entity, <laughs> even by yourself, actually, technically. But, you know, so um, oh. I try to really think of the output of chat GPT as informed suggestions. Uh, I never trust it, right? I never would like take what it says and immediately paste it into something and send it off. Uh, but it's it's wonderful at, at coming up with suggestions. And then you as the human, as the one who's actually going to take the next step, has have to decide whether those things make sense. Um, you know, you could say, give me five ideas for how I might launch a behavior change technique to get people to quit smoking let's say, it's a random example, uh, it'll do a great job. It'll give you five ideas. You could say, give me 10 more ideas. It'll give you 10 more ideas. You don't then take all 15 ideas and say, let's do them all. You then look at them all and think, okay, so you know, what's the emotionality involved here? Did it appreciate that? You could also tell it, by the way. You could say, I want you to focus on practicality, emotionality, and individual experience of any of the ideas you give me. For each of the ideas, tell me about any emotional impacts that it might have or that it might have been informed by, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, it'll follow whatever instructions you give it. Uh, its output really has to kind of be considered by the consumer, by you, the user, by the by the pilot, right? So it's like the tour guide. If the tour guide says, you know, I, I suggest we go try this restaurant and that restaurant and go here, you, you want to, I guess in the tour guide example, they have local expertise. And so you might give it more weight than if it's just a text generator suggesting it. But at the same time, it is the kind of the fanciest text generator ever created. I, I do tend to think of it in a weird way, like the oracle of old, the, the mythical oracle. It, it, it really is kind of like an odd oracle that has no common sense. Um, and, and even like going back to the idea of oracles and the words of the gods, right? I mean, there's no connection to emotionality. There's some kind of abstract sense of truth that they operate on, but you would never trust their... Um, their advice or their opinions or recommendations to be informed by human experience because they're not humans, right? The oracles, the gods, things like that. So it, it's kind of, it's an interesting question. <laughs> when you were talking about um, giving um, giving prompts or priming, um, I was also thinking about um, when, uh, because the priming helps um establish uh, a certain direction that you have, which is kind of your intention. So mm -hmm. in the same way, uh, it, differently, uh, when you talk to somebody, um, and if it's somebody who knows you, 
Uh, so the example of the tour guide, say that the tour guide is a distant relative who knows you and knows your taste and knows what you like and what you've been enjoying in the past, then there is a different set of recommendations likely uh, than if, if it's just someone you go on a tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And th there is definitely uh, a sense of trust and a sense of uh, not just trust, but also a belief that they know you and they would only recommend places that you would like because they know what your tastes are. Um, and I have, I have, I hate to say it, but it's kind of the same with ChatGPT as well. So uh, in ChatGPT or in most of these LLMs, you can actually have separate conversations, and and each conversation. Th this, by the way, is something that is really fundamentally important and is a huge mistake that many companies have made. So, for instance, things like Bing. There's these other search engines out there where. Um, they are more like search engines as opposed to chat, which is more of an LLM, but, but uh, they, they tend not to let you have multiple separate conversations. And, and it's really important because if you have a, a glider that you're going to take on explorations of health and medicine, uh, if you then start asking the questions about um, legal issues, ethics, relationship advice, it doesn't really know that. In fact, it gets very confused if you if you kind of positioned it and primed it to think about let's let's say physical health, mm -hmm. uh, and then you start asking about emotional health. It doesn't know what to do. The whole system it'll it'll try, but you kind of have muddied the waters. So you really should have separate conversations. Now, the relevance to this is that I I for instance have a separate conversation where I talk to it about my dreams, my aspirations, my fears, you know, what matters to me. I've, I've told it about my background, about my achievements, about things that I'm, I'm disappointed, didn't work, et cetera. And, and it's fantastic. If I go there and I say, you know, I'm feeling a bit down today. Can you give me any words of encouragement, thought, or advice? It, the stuff it says just really resonates incredibly well with me because it knows me. It, 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 you know, it's, it's weird to say it knows me because it's just an algorithm, it, but it has taken into consideration into a, its activated prime space. It, it kind of has activated everything that I've told it, and now it can offer me very personalized advice. So in that same context, if I had a, if I was going to go to Rome, let's say, uh, or to Florence, let's say, and I, I miss Florence, I want to go back to Rome too, but uh, I would, I would tell it about the kinds of food I love, about the kinds of art I love, what I'm interested in or not interested in mm -hmm. history. Um, you know, I'm not that interested in military history. I'm, I, you know, I'm more interested in artistic history and uh, personal narratives, etc. Then I would ask it to give me a tour guide or a, a proposed tour plan for my visit to Florence, and it would be fantastic. I would venture to say it's probably going to be better than any human, even if it's someone who's known you your whole life. I predict it might actually be better at coming up with a tour plan than that person would be. Maybe not, because it's still a fairly coarse representation, but it's impressive at how well it can take into consideration personal, emotional uh, kind of needs and constraints. At the same time, you mentioned uh, it's a little bit autistic, uh, quote unquote, right. in that it doesn't have emotion. Um, so that's what you meant uh, by it. And so it won't be disappointed if you don't take its advice, probably. True. That's true, yeah. Um, it, it will say it's disappointed by the way. So like if you, it, it'll often give me a, a bad response and I'll say that was absolute garbage. I don't know what you're thinking, but that is not. And it apologizes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me try again. I didn't mean to insult you. Here's, is this more what you were thinking about? So it does have the right words that indicate it should have emotion, but of course it, it doesn't, as far as, as we understand emotionality, it doesn't have any emotion. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's an interesting question, right? Because it's it's read every book written by humans, so it does mm -hmm. understand what the emotional response should be to a particular event, action, statement, etc. Uh, and it can probably imitate it pretty well. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it becomes a really interesting question: it, Is that really really emotion, or is that just <laughs> pretend emotion? And that's where we get more of a philosophical question. <laughs> so. Well, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so now that we're talking about all of these uh, uh, threads about knowing if it cares, if it's emotional, I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, social robots. 
and the future of healthcare and assistance. Uh, and of course, we've had some early models already in market for a number of years. Um, and we've had movies uh, talk about uh, assistance or um, assistance robots, right? Um, and so tell me a little bit, um, I know this is one of the uh, parts of your research. How, how are we doing there? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. How are we doing there? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I guess it depends what metric you want to measure on, etc. cetera. But uh, I guess so the, the, the place where social robots, I think, have been most successful so far have been in, for instance, in retirement communities, nursing homes, kind of care facilities where you find mm -hmm. that it's got one of the, the most successful one is the little seal. It's a robot that looks like a seal and you can give it to a, an older person who's living in a retirement community or living on their own and um, they enjoy it. it. It kind of responds to them. It doesn't have words. They don't tend to be uh, vocal currently. Uh, or there's also a similar robot that looks like a cat. Um, and, and statistically, people have done studies and uh, individuals who have these social companions end up living longer, end up having fewer health problems, end up happier in their day-to-day -day life. And um, it, it, it does seem like these kind of social robots have a great uh, benefit to individuals who are using them. Now, that's wonderful. Uh, and, you know, it's great. I, and I think it really should be pushed much more. I think the government should be investing in creating these and giving them out for free. I think there's some important social justice issues here, right? If it's only the very wealthy you can afford these life and happiness extending things, that's not a great thing. But uh, in any case, those don't really talk. Those don't really have emotion. They have some simulated emotion. Uh, as things like ChatGPT, et cetera, come out, get more and more advanced, they'll start to have more like personalities, et cetera. So uh, social robots are awesome. The one thing to keep in mind here also is that there were similar studies done 20 years ago showing that if you give a person in a similar circumstances a plant, a little plant to take care of and to water, they also will be a happier mm -hmm. person, have fewer health problems, live longer. So part of it is the object itself, but a big part of it is the feelings that the, the human has towards the object. Right? So if I feel like I'm caring for a plant, it gives me a meaning, it gives me a sense of purpose, et cetera, and it, it makes me happier and healthier, even though the plant has almost no response. I mean, it lives, it dies, it thrives, et cetera. So it has something. But it, uh, uh, if you have a social robot that pretends, that, that acts as if it is being cared for by you, et cetera, you'll get the same kind of thing. And as the robot gets more and more sophisticated, and pretty soon they will be much more sophisticated. I, I can imagine a future where it's, you know, a kind of a talking dog or a talking cat and has a personality and knows you and can have sort of therapeutic interactions with you. That that will be a wonderful blessing, I would say. And I don't know. I know some people find that depressing, but I don't know, if, if I could imagine my future, if I'm living in a retirement community on my own, uh, you know, I'd much rather have a kind of commutative social robot who can talk to me and uh, who seems to have a relationship with me, as opposed to just being on my own or just having a plant to take care of. So the metaphor you mentioned is that of the animal, right? The, the, the companion and a lot of people, uh, especially people who have dogs, um, yes they tend to uh, really uh, almost, uh, and dogs have learned through domestication to have expressions and to use expressions uh, and uh, a behavior that elicits a certain uh, responses from their human, right? The human who takes care of them. So I'm guessing that that's, that's where we're starting. Um, yeah. Are we... Um, looking at uh, assistance in terms of like physical assistance, for example, it, it sounds like this is companionship. Um, yes, De definitely. The physical side of it would be wonderful as well. Right. I mean, if they could help you, it, it's, it's, I, sh I should take it a kind of a little step back. I just want to point out. So I'll often talk to my students about social robots and I'll, I'll say how, if you want to have, let's say in, in the future, there will be, there already are, but there'll be more social robots. We'll have little things that are something like a little Roomba, an electric vacuum cleaner, <laughs> but with a with a kind of a, a human, well, let's say a dog type of body on top, and it moves around, it goes around the house, and maybe it has a tray, it can carry some things, move things around. That's wonderful. Uh, but that 
object, that robot should really interact very differently if it's interacting, let's say, with me versus with my, if I have a grandmother living at the house who has a bit of Alzheimer's mm -hmm. dementia, it should be able to interact with that person very differently. It should interact with my, I don't have one, but a three-year-old child, for instance, it should interact very differently. And I always tell my students that, you know, if you're going to build successful social robots, you need mechanical engineers who are going to build the wheels and the physical thing. You need, you're going to need electrical engineers to do all the wiring. Computer scientists are going to have to program it all up. But I would not trust really any of those people, mechanical, electrical, computer scientists, to build the personality of the robot, to, mm -hmm. to understand the emotional needs of the humans and actually craft the right reactions, personality, and style for the robot to have. And that's where you need someone I always use it as a way to sell human factors engineering as a, as a career path, but I do think it's a, it's a, a missing a gap in the market where you don't have, you wouldn't want most computer scientists to be in charge of deciding how the robot should interact with someone who has Alzheimer's, for instance. Uh, you need someone who knows how to use empathy, use design thinking, use kind of um, all of the tools that designers can use to, to understand how that social robot should interact with the other person. So yeah, it's it's uh, that that's kind of another side of social robots is how to actually design them, how to use uh, all of our human abilities to to kind of uh, craft the abilities and the response styles of the robot. So I'm wondering, as you're talking, uh, whether you know, like right now, we set up our systems. You know, we put our colors. You know, the colors we like, the the screen splash we want, etc. And I wonder. If it's, uh, it would be possible at some point uh, in the future to set up our uh, yeah. uh, um, social robot to, yeah. you know, to be the way we want it, you know, to have certain characteristics or certain responses to prompts or priming from us in a certain direction. So definitely. And, and I mean, I think that I hate to go back to chat GPT again, but I'm going to, you know, in chat GPT, actually, now you, you can do that. You, you can tell it from now on when you're responding to me, I'd like it if you only respond in, in poetry, or you could say, I'd like you to only respond to me. You know, I have mine set up to respond in a certain way to, you know, don't, don't ever suggest solutions that are obvious, generic, pedestrian. Instead, focus more on ones that are innovative, creative, and novel. Uh, when you're responding to me, don't use extra words. Try to use just bare minimum unless I ask you to do that. And uh, try to be polite. Try to incorporate a little bit of humor and uh, creativity. You know, when I ask it to draft a, an outline of a paper, for instance, I, 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 I tell it that I wanted to have a certain gravitas in the paper and a philosophical depth in addition to its engineering. And so you, you already can kind of do that in things like ChatGPT. And um, my hunch is that it's going to be things very much like the models in ChatGPT that initially are going to be the brains of social robots, at least the brains for responding and interacting to humans. Um, and so, so happily and, and kind of weirdly, it's already kind of there. It's here already. It, 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 it's kind of a shock, by the way, how incredibly powerful ChatGPT and other LLMs turned out to be. I think most experts in the field were really surprised that that it became so good um, so quickly. I, many of these things are, are uh, capabilities that most experts thought would take 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, and now suddenly they're here. And we don't really know what to do with it. Uh, and every day there's incredible new discoveries being made and advances being made. I, I kind of feel like I, I should be going around the streets and waking and say, you know, you don't realize it, but around you now, the <sighs> entire world is changing and, and the speed of change is accelerating. Yeah. I, I like to say that if you ever, let's say 500 years from now, if we're still here, uh, <laughs> if you look back at a graph of human let's say, flourishing, creativity, innovation, scientific advance. If you look at that, there'll be this one point in November 2022 where suddenly everything accelerates. There's going to be better music, better art, better poetry, better medicine, better engineering, um, more creative outputs, greater advances in every front because of things like ChatGPT and, and, and all the other AI technologies around it. And, and we're really at, at anything... That so so when this all started happening, when things became very public back in, uh, I guess November of last year, ChatGPT came out, and you know I I started playing around with it, and I was thinking, wow, you know, a year from now or two years from now, they'll be able to do dunk dunk dunk. I had you know a bunch of ideas for things that could happen a year or two from now, and then. 
two weeks later, those things happened. Uh, and then I thought, wow, okay, well, I could imagine in six months, these kind. and then two weeks later, those things happened. I mean, the, most of the advances that, that experts thought would take six months, a year mm -hmm. or two years are now happening on the order of weeks. Uh, it is incredible how quickly things are going. Uh, just in the last six months, there's been this acceleration in, in, in everything from the technology side. Now, of course, the arts, the, the applications to medicine, to science, to social justice, to society hasn't kept up uh, for, for a whole bunch of different reasons, unfortunately. Uh, but, but I think all of those things will happen. Now, the flip side of that, I like to say that ChatGPT can help anyone do anything better. Um, and so, for instance, if you are a terrorist, it can help you be a better terrorist. You can be the most effective terrorist ever. Um, and and it's that, that to me is the most terrifying part of all of this, is that this tool uh, can really help anyone do anything they want to do better. And if you want to cause problems, if you want to spread misinformation, et cetera, it can help you, unfortunately, do that better. Um, and, and thankfully, they, there are um, guardrails in place. So with ChatGPT, you cannot ask it to help you perform a terrorist action better. Um, scarily, there are many models out there that you can find that that don't have guardrails in place. And so bad actors will start using it to do their stuff better, better as well. So that 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 to me is the real problem. There, there's other concerns people are worried about, but but that's a big issue, I think. So yeah, history, right? <laughs> Yeah. So, um, in the, looking over your uh, progression uh, in your career, uh, uh, it, stri it struck me how you've you've had moments when you were uh, doing very practical things, and moments when you were, you know, more on in the academic world. And um, I wanted to. Uh, to have your sense on the importance of applying research. Uh, you, of course, you've been talking about use cases or ways to apply what we know about uh, these tools um, and human factors uh, to real life, um, real life products and, and services. So um, has that helped you, uh, hindered you? Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I guess, um, it, it's, uh, it's helped in some ways and hindered in other ways, right? So if you, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of the right way to, to explain it. I, I guess for me personally, I think that there's incredible value in both the theoretical side, no application whatsoever, and the applied side. And I think that people are doing fantastic work in both domains. I don't think less of the people who are just doing the academic theoretical mm. work. And I don't think less of those who want to do it in the applied camp. Um, I know that often, at least stereotypically, those who are doing the theory kind of look down on those doing the applied and those doing the applied look down on those doing just theory. But to me, they're both invaluable, right? That you need to make progress on both of these fronts to really move ahead in any way that the applied can't really make uh, solid advances without a deep understanding of the theoretical. And the theoretical often can find relevance in looking for applications, and they can also empower and enable greater um, applied issues. So I think they're both really important. Um, I guess for me personally, it, it, uh, there's been this interesting oscillation where uh, I, didn't, I, I did a PhD, and then I did a postdoc in neuro, PhD in psychology, then I did a postdoc in neurology, um, and that was wonderful. And then I decided that I didn't really like just doing theory stuff. And so I left academic work for um, four or five years and I went to the more applied world. I ran innovation centers and think tanks and um, head uh, innovation stuff, let's say, but it was all applied innovation, uh, me me developing methods and mechanisms to help people be more innovative, et cetera. Anyway, I did that kind of work. And um, I was at that point, the academic work sort of worked in my favor, although I was often thought of as, well, he's just an egghead. So, you know, you can't really, you know, he doesn't really understand stuff about the real world. So it kind of helped me get in the door, but then had some downsides. And 
Then when I came back to academia, again, it sort of worked both ways. Well, you know, he's been in industry, but that was also valued. Many people in academia also value the, the kind of insights and the experience that you can get from industry. So I don't know, it, it's kind of worked both ways. I, I've been lucky enough to be able to kind of make the transition a few times from academics to industry and back to academics and, and back to industry. Um, I found them both incredibly informative. There's, I have some things I love about each of them and hate about each of them, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it, I think the two together are really required to make great progress. Yes. And, uh, and uh, you seem to be able to straddle the two worlds uh, because you also still do some consulting, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I still do uh, consulting. I, I also, uh, one of the things I'm kind of passionate about is I get my students to work on projects for real companies. So, you know, back in the old days, if you were working in a, let's say, marketing business school kind of context mm -hmm. where I spent a couple of years, um, you would have your students read case studies. They'd read about how Apple did this and how Xerox did that and, you know, all these interesting and. For me, that, that's interesting, that's important, that's educational, but I instead got my students, and I still get my students to actually work with real companies. Not big companies like Apple, but little startups or little um, student groups or social justice organizations or things like that. And I, I think that making the student experience include some application uh, enriches the experience, makes them understand it at a much deeper level. And I think it's also kind of good for the world to try to get students working on real projects, not just kind of studying things or doing kind of uh, fake lab-based projects. Again, it depends what you're doing. If you're teaching physics, doing lab experiments in a very controlled environment makes sense. If you're trying to teach people about design or about marketing, it really makes much more sense to get them out there in the real world, addressing the, the actual issues that are out there. Tell me a little bit about your experience in the UK. You spent uh, quite a bit of time there. Yes. Yeah. I was in the UK for 13 years, uh, living in North Wales, kind of the middle of nowhere, but Bangor University. Um, I, I sort of fell in love with the place. It was a, a fabulous place to raise kids, um, a little bit isolated and a little bit uh, kind of far from uh, culture, events, theater, stuff like that. But but it was wonderful. And and uh, it was I found it really um enlightening and eye-opening to to live in a different culture for so long. I think it's a really valuable experience for anyone to get this kind of sense of perspective on uh, where they came from, on their beliefs, etc. So, um, you know, I found it valuable. I also uh, was really impressed with the level of research, the level of applicability, the, I don't know, I, you know, I, coming from the USA, there's kind of this isolationist kind of perspective where well usa we have the best science the best engineering the best entrepreneurship and you go spend some time in other countries you realize they actually have some fantastic often better technology education um innovation going on in other countries as well and i mean it, it's obvious in hindsight but it, it was really for me quite um yeah. eye-opening i guess i could say just just to be exposed to that level of uh understanding how having grown up in the USA, being buried in the USA media system, uh, it, it really was kind of brainwashing. And it's kind of nice to live in another country and have sort of your blinders removed and realize that, you know, oh, I was kind of led to believe that this was the center, but it's not at all. It was a myth created by the media now. You know, I mean, there is great medicine, great science, engineering, etc. happening in the USA, but there's there's pockets and, and oceans of the same kind of stuff happening in every country. And so I, I, I found that really... Uh, kind of, I don't know, refreshingly eye-opening. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, it was it was a great place, and I. And I miss that's it. interesting. I mean, we've been talking about priming, um, and I think there is a great deal of priming that happens in culture, yes. and um, uh, you're being away and being far from uh, the type of contest you were used to. It probably uh, gave you perspective and uh, gave you depth. Uh, of uh, you were able then to compare uh, yes. realities, yeah. And, and uh, actually, it, it brings me back. I wanted to, uh, as I was kind of preparing for our discussion today and thinking about the concept of value, um, I, one of the things that I, I started really thinking about was kind of the relativistic sense of value, right? So that, um, you know, one of the examples I was thinking about is that 
you know, $5 doesn't mean a ton to me right now, and it means much less to a billionaire, uh, but it could have great value for someone living on the street or someone who doesn't have access to money. And, uh, and I think as designers, as advertisers, as humans in general, it's important that we recognize the kind of relativistic nature of value. And that if you're trying to design something, I guess, speaking from my world more, more than others, that if you're trying to design a new product, service, app, experience, ad campaign, whatever you're trying to design, you really need to kind of understand the value that it might deliver to the person who you're crafting it for. So if it's a new um, uh, social robot for home health kind of things, like we were discussing earlier, um, it, you know, it might not be something that adds great value to my life, but I could imagine someone else out there for whom this might be life-saving, life-altering, like really uh, fundamentally important thing. Um, and, and I think that's that's kind of a an important point that often gets overlooked in, in the field of human factors. Uh, and, and actually in, in business in general, there was this concept from Taylor, Taylorism, Frederick Taylor, you know, trying to design more efficient systems, kind of, uh, and, and there, one of the goals was to try to find the one best way to do something, like the best way, the optimal way to assemble a car or the best way to deliver healthcare, let's say. And um, I mean, I think that something that gets often overlooked is that the whole concept of best uh, isn't as obvious as it, it might seem at first, that even the concept of best, it, it depends what you're trying to optimize, right? So traditionally in the in the world of engineering, the best is the most optimal, the fastest, the least expensive, let's say, way of assembling a car. But best might also now, we know, of course, mean most sustainable, most equitable, uh, uses the least resources, uses the least water, impacts the fewest other people, you know, benefits the, the greater environment. And so the whole concept of optimization and best is kind of a similar concept to the idea of value, that it really depends what you're trying to optimize and for whom you're trying to optimize it. So, you know, the value that, that you might find in something really you have to think about what's the value for this person in their context, given their aspirations, fears, loves, traits, things like that. That's interesting because um, in this in this method that you've just expressed, uh, it's more the concept of value is more kind of value in use rather than value in, in exchange, which is where we always go when we think about value, how much does it cost, how much does it save? And um, there is more of a consideration around a quantitative or more objective way of looking at value rather than qualitative, uh, yes. uh, which is how usually we, are, we think about value. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I, I think that there is, well, there is value in <laughs> considering value, uh, both in use and in exchange. But I think, again, it has to be relativistic. This is something that I think, you know, from the old traditions of Aristotle and people like that, they missed this point that it's not just value in use or in exchange, but it's also value to an individual in a context in use and in exchange, right? So that um, the value I mean, I think one of the simplest, clearest example is just the value in exchange of a, a note, a $5 bill, let's say, right? It has a value in exchange, its value is kind of $5, but but that means nothing if it's $5 to Bill Gates, but it means a lot if it's $5 to someone living on the streets in a country where there is no money. <laughs> well, not no money, but where, where uh, you know, that's the monthly wage for someone in a country if you give them that $5 bill. So the same object in the same kind of context of exchange has very different meanings depending on the individual and the circumstances. And to, to me, that's a really important concept in design as well, that if you're designing a new app, a new robot, a new system, it, you really have to think about who's going to be the user and what's their context of use and what matters to them. But I think the value really has to be understood in this kind of broader, broader framework. So they have skipped the design uh, part. Yeah, you're telling me. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, or or they neglect that. that there, there is a belief that the, I, I think part of the problem is the idea that there is a universal value and that the value has has a quantifiable, like you said, uh, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, uh, that the, there there is a value, and and I think that that's just not true. That the value entirely is dependent on the the receiver. Uh, 
actually the giver, the receiver, the circumstances around all of that, that, that that's where sort of value can be found. So that's, um, I would like to actually uh, stop, uh, stop here because I think this is um, worth uh, considering. It's worth thinking about. Uh, you've uh, given us uh, a lot to think about. And so I want to thank you for uh, uh, very much for your time today. Thanks. And uh, I do look forward to uh, uh, learning more about your explorations with uh, social justice, with the uh, social robots, with uh, um, uh, uh, robotic assistance, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll we'll put all the good stuff in it, <laughs> all <laughs> we'll the stuff out. that helps us. That's right. That helps right. the individuals it, it's intended for. Yes, that's right. A and doesn't hurt people for whom it wasn't intended, right? That's the other side of it. So, you know, things like automated systems often are designed to help some people, but we don't realize that by doing that, they're actually hurting others. So I hope that the, the value it creates is great for many people, not just for the intended users as well. <laughs> anyway, so, but thanks so much for having me. It was, it was lots of fun. Thank you very much, everyone. You've been listening and watching a conversation on value on Traces and Dreams. I'm your host, Valeria Maltoni. I hope you'll join us again for next conversation. And if you have enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Traces and Dreams and, um, and check us out.